Okay, everybody, I'm going to go ahead and get things started. And as more people join, um, we will, uh, Alexandra, if you want to throw that um, link in there, maybe a few more times as we go ahead and get things started. That way, uh, people who are joining a few minutes after can still um, get that to you. So hi, everybody. My name is Jenna Nilo. I am the Director of Marketing and Outreach with Illinois Digital Educators Alliance. Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, we're here today for a fun interactive webinar um, on computer science unplugged with Legos. So I hope you brought some bricks. Um, Leanna and Alexandra are going to um, take over in a minute and show us uh, how we can use Legos uh, in the classroom or virtually, um, as the case may be, to uh, get some of those computer science principles um, understood by your students. So this will be a fun interactive um, webinar. But before I turn things over to Alexandra and Leanna, um, I just wanted to go over a few housekeeping items. Um, so first and foremost, if you could do me a favor and keep your um, camera off, that way Leanna um, especially will have the spotlight um, of the video here because she's going to be showing us some stuff um, on her camera. So definitely um, go ahead and uh, keep your camera off. And then also, if you wouldn't mind keeping yourself muted, we do welcome interaction um, throughout the webinar, but please do me a favor and use that chat window. Um, Leanna, Alexandra, and I will all be monitoring that window and making sure that we get all of your questions answered. So please use that chat window, ask questions, answer questions if anybody has them. Um, definitely, you know, a lot of minds are better than just one, so we definitely um, welcome all that interaction. But if you keep yourself muted, then we won't have all the background um, noise that is inevitable. My dog's going to probably go bonkers in a minute, so um, definitely um, we appreciate that. And then if you are looking for your PDH, um, if you're an Illinois ed educator looking for your PDH, or if you're not an Illinois educator and you're just looking for a certificate of completion to provide to your um, school district or whomever the case may be, at the end of today's session in that chat window, I will put a link um, to fill out the form to start that process. So um, stay on, uh, ISB does require that is, it is live attendance. So stick around till the end of the um, webinar and I will let you know when I'm putting that in so you can go back and look at that chat window as well. Um, I think that's about it. So without further ado, I am going to turn things over to Alexandra and Leanna. I'm gonna stop sharing my screen so that you guys can take over. And Leanna, I'm going to assume that you want me to spotlight video you. Let yes, me know if great. that is not the case. Okay, so I am going to go ahead and spotlight video you. I think. And, and then I don't know if you plan on sharing screen at all, but I'm going to open up the share for you as well, oh, just in thank case. Thank you. Yes. Okay. Cool. And um, hello, everybody. I probably need to, I may need to cancel the spotlight then too if you're going to share screen. No, I'm not. I don't know. Let me know. I, no, okay. I just wanted to mention one more time that if, um, that I'm collecting contact information on the side, but this is, um, my name is Alexandra Vlahakis and I am um, your Lego representative for the Chicago and Illinois area. So if you needed any information, please feel free to contact me. But at this time, I'll let Leanna introduce herself and take this over. Awesome. Thanks so much. Um, I have Alex's information up there, um, her email address if you need to get in touch with her. Um, and uh, for those of you who don't know me, I'm uh, Dr. Leanna Prater. I'm a solutions architect with LEGO Education. Um, so I've been with the company about two and a half years full time, but prior to joining LEGO Education, I was a classroom teacher. Um, so I've spent many years uh, teaching uh, at the elementary and um, one, one year even at the middle school level, um, but spent most of my years in instructional technology. Um, usually when I start talking, people are like, oh, you are probably not from Illinois, which is correct. Um, I actually live in Lexington, Kentucky, um, and that is where I spent most of my years teaching school. Uh, I still teach one graduate class on occasion at a local college here uh, for computer science for teachers, which is a fun class to teach. Um, most of my uh, students in that course have never uh, programmed anything ever. Um, so it's great to watch them on that learning journey um, to explore what is possible and things that you can create with code. 
um, good time. Super excited to uh, be with you all today. Um, we've already gone over some norms, so I'm going to kind of skip over that real quick, but um, I'm sure you all are getting very accustomed to uh, webinar and virtual formats by now. So for those of you who are not familiar with LEGO Education, I wanted to just take a minute to talk about our mission statement uh, at LEGO Education. So our mission is really to inspire and develop those builders of tomorrow. And when I think about the builders of tomorrow, um, I think about people that will be building with physical materials, right? But also building um, their ideas with uh, digital devices too, um, which is pretty exciting when we think about what the future holds for our kids, right? And, and as part of that um, at LEGO Education, we really want to enable every student to be successful. Um, so providing kids early on with those experiences that help uh, build understanding, get them excited uh, about different career uh, possibilities um, so they're ready to take on the world when they graduate, right? So for today's session, if you have Lego bricks, that is awesome. Um, so if you have some, you can Get them out and we're going to be doing some hands-on activities today and if you don't have lego bricks no worries um, you can probably just use what you have if you want to do something hands-on paper pencil uh, or markers probably would work just as well you can draw out ideas um, or you know use pencils to draw shapes and things like that to participate um, even if you have bricks, paper pencil is probably helpful for some of the activities that we're going to be doing. Uh, we're going to use the chat feature uh, in uh, Zoom as well. So sometimes I'll pose a question. Uh, feel free to contribute your ideas in the chat session. And, um, and I appreciate uh, my uh, helpers, Jenna and uh, Alex, uh, who are moderating the chat as well to kind of be looking for questions. So when I get started, I'm going to talk about the slide here in one second, but I also want to mention just about bricks in general for today. So bricks, you know, are, are a medium and they're a great medium to use for lots of things. We use them to build ideas. Um, but I want you to think about bricks as, as being a representation of something, right? It's just, it can be a symbol for lots of things. So this brick, um, you know, is just a red two by four brick but I could also um, say that this brick represents an idea. Maybe this re represents um, computational thinking for me. And when I'm using it, I'm, I'm referencing this brick to talk about computational thinking. Even my little duck here, um, you know, when I have my uh, um, one by two brick off of him, he's just a one by two yellow brick. But as soon as I attach him to my duck, and now all of a sudden he's a tail and I can talk about it. So when we're using our bricks today or anytime that you're using bricks with kids, um, you know, you can think about bricks in different ways and, and being able to attach ideas uh, to bricks is a great way for kids to uh, communicate their thoughts, uh, whether that's uh, orally or in, um, in written format, uh, because a lot of times they'll have a model that they can speak to. So I'll put, that's, Quackers there, I'll put him right back down. So the very first question I have for everyone, um, and you can use bricks if you have bricks, and if you don't, you can use paper, pencil, and draw, and if you don't want to do either of those things, that's fabulous as well. Um, you can just think about the question and contribute in the chat, set, um, the chat feature in Zoom, but I want you to think about this phrase. When I think about computer science, I think about and the great thing about this question is there's no wrong answer because it's just whatever you think about. So you can build that idea, you can draw that idea, or you can just take a minute to think and then contribute in the chat um, what you think about. You've got a, a few answers here. Awesome. Um, you said coding. Another person says solving, solving problems in creatively, computers and screens, coding and robotics thinking. 
a digital solution, computational thinking, problem solving, robotics. Awesome. Coding, collaboration, and problem solving. Building something that benefits everyone. Awesome. Lots and lots of great ideas coming in. More options to use to creatively solve ideas, transferring basic skills to new programs, apps, and ideas, inputs and outputs. Awesome. Okay. So um, let's think here for a minute. Maybe you came up with some of these ideas, and maybe you thought of some that I don't have included, um, which is highly likely as well. Um, I will say that this slide goes against everything that I believe in in PowerPoint. There's a lot of text on this slide, um, so I apologize for that. But I think that also speaks to um, just computer science in general. It is a very broad topic and it encompasses lots of different things. I think sometimes when we say computer science, people a lot of times just think coding or just think programming, but there's a lot more to it than just that. Um, you know, it is that thinking um, that's so important uh, that we develop in our students. In, in addition to software, it's also about the hardware. Um, you know, and, and I would say computer science touches so many other uh, fields as well. Um, you know, when you think about talking with, you know, elementary kids uh, about computer science, a lot of times they have in their own mind, like, what they think a computer scientist is and and what they do, um, but you can you can have great conversations with kids early on about this topic. Um, you know, I know a lot of kids when I taught school video games were very popular then. They're still very popular now. Um, you know, but I wonder if kids have ever really thought about you know who are the people that are designing those games? How does computer science skills and knowledge help them do their job better? Um, even from the people who are uh, you know, the programmer side of things, right? Programming the game itself, but also those people who are, I would like to say the arts people, right? The people who are creating those graphics. Um, how do they create those graphics to fit into a game? And again, computer science is a big part of that. And it's starting to even touch other areas too when we think about textiles, you know, creating, um, you know, fabrics that can respond to the environment around them. Um, so our kids who, who would not, you would not typically think that would be interested in computer science might spark an interest with them when we can start sharing with them ways that computer science touches uh, lots of different areas. So why should we teach computer science? Why is it important, um, especially early on? Well, for the state of Illinois, um, I, got this information from code.org. So code.org does a great job of putting out uh, state-specific um, statistics around computer science, and they update it every year. So these are pretty current um, in regards to stats. So last year, there was um, almost 24,000 open computing jobs in the state of Illinois. And the average salary for somebody in this field um, is you know, a little over $84,000. But the state only graduated about 2,500 students in, um, with a bachelor's degree in computer science in 2018. And so out of that, that number, a small percentage of them were girls. So you can start to see that there's a large number of jobs in this field, and we don't have a lot of people opting to um, kind of go into this as a career pathway. And because of the salary that's associated with it, you know, for a lot of uh, kids, for a lot of families, it's often a pathway out of poverty for them if we can get them, you know, to a point where they elect to select this as a career pathway and uh, get education beyond high school for these. So in Illinois, the number of AP exams taken last year uh, was, Pretty, pretty decent number, you know, 7,692, not bad. But when you start to look at the number of um, underrepresented populations that are electing to take this course, um, 
you'll see that we have some gaps, right? And I will also say that this is not specific to Illinois. When you look at data from across the United States, I would argue if you look at data globally, you will see a lot of the same trends, that there are a lot of open computing jobs. We don't have states that are, um, you know, producing the workforce needed to fill these jobs. And they have um, a pretty decent salary associated with them. And we have kids that are taking AP courses in high school, but not a ton of them, right? And we have kids in underrepresented populations that are not electing to take them. So I often ask myself, you know, why are these kids not taking these courses? You know, is it that they don't feel prepared? Have they not had enough exposure to it? Is it just not interesting to them? So those are great questions as educators for us to ask. And so for this session, uh, I'd love to frame um, sessions around big questions. So this is the question that I was thinking about when designing this uh, webinar around Unplugged for Computer Science is, you know, how can we provide all children access to opportunities to develop computational thinking and computer science, you know, the skills, the knowledge, the dispositions associated with that. So they're ready not only for life after graduation, um, if that's a career pathway for them, but they're ready to live and function in a world that is very connected because of computer science. So what are unplugged activities, unplugged lessons? Well, unplugged lessons are a way that you can introduce computer science or computational thinking concepts in a, in a hands-on manner. A lot of times they're connected to other content um, and uh, real world ideas, so it, it makes it very easy to understand. And it also lets kids develop those 21st century skills that we know are so important. Another benefit is that, um, you know, it gives kids a real opportunity to practice using that academic language um, in, a, in a very real scenario. And because we're using Lego bricks, um, you know, you have all that, uh, the characteristics of play that come into, uh, into play as part of it. So, you know, when, when you're building with bricks, it's fun. Um, kids are often smiling. They're engaged because they're creating things that have meaning to them. Um, it's a very iterative process uh, because bricks, I always say, are very forgiving. You can put them together. You can take them apart. You can put them back together again to kind of uh, tinker with your ideas a little bit. And we're typically engaged with other people. Um, you know, it's very socially interactive um, because we wanna share those ideas with others. And I don't care if you're three or 93, but um, all those characteristics of play are present when we're engaged in play. So we're gonna to start today with uh, this idea around computational thinking. So I'm gonna move these bricks out of the way real quick. And I'll make my, I'll stop sharing here in a second um, so I can make my video a lot bigger. But if you have paper and pencil, it would be really helpful to draw out a little grid like this. And if you have bricks, um, you can designate um, brick color. So we're gonna use four bricks of the same color, but you need four sets of them. So like four yellow, four red, four blue, four green. And if you don't have bricks, no worries. You can just substitute a brick color for a shape that you draw on your paper or something along those lines. But we're gonna walk through this idea of computa computational thinking, which is really a way to solve problems. And um, computational thinking includes the things listed on the slide it includes um, breaking things down into smaller parts, decomposition, you know, looking for patterns, thinking algorithmically, you know, step by step, um, examining, looking for mistakes in what you're doing, how you can improve it, but also how you can simplify it uh, a little bit as well. So here's my, my grid here, and I'm going to put my bricks 
And, um, and we're using color, um, but you could also use a book shape, kind of whatever makes you happy. And when I set this up in the chat box, um, you might just share what this kind of reminds you of. Does it remind you of some other kind of paper pencil game? You've got an answer? Oh yeah. I think we also have a question. I'm so sorry. Vanessa asked, why was the learn to learn kit discontinued? That's a great um, question. And I'm not sure, Alex, that was actually before I joined Lego Education. But we can uh, find out for sure and get back with them. Um, so tic-tac-toe is one of your answers. So Duco is another one of your answers. Awesome. So it is, it's a lot like a Sudoku puzzle, right? So if you've never um, completed a Sudoku puzzle before, I'll, I'll walk you through it really quick. The goal is to have a different color brick in every row. So we'll have one of each color in each row. We'll also have one of each color in each column, and we'll have one of each color in each quadrant. That's why you need to have four of whatever it is that you're using. And, um, and if you're doing this with kids in a virtual setting, by the way, and if they don't have bricks at home, no worries. I mean, they can use, like I said, marker colors, or they could use paper clips, pretty much whatever they have that's, that's hands-on um, to kind of manipulate um, ideas. That's why I like objects instead of just colors, but if they don't have that, that's fine. They can use, you know, pieces of paper, whatever. So the first step is to think about what are the steps, if I were going to write out steps to solve for this square right here, what would I need to do? You know, what would, um, what would I need to have in the first row? What would I need to have in the first column? And what would I need to have in the first quadrant? So I would look to see in row one, you know, what colors are missing in row two, in column one, what's missing in quadrant one, what's missing. And then if it's the same brick, um, that's the color of brick that's going to go there. And if it's more than one, then I'm going to have to pick another square and try again, right? So what color square, by the way, or what color goes right here? Anybody know? Blue. Blue. You can test that and see. Awesome. So blue is going to go here. So now I'm going to solve for this. So I'm going to look to see, you know, what is missing in this row, what's missing or column, what's missing in the row, what's missing in the quadrant. So what brick color is going to go here? Yep, red. Answers. Absolutely. Yep, they said red. So take a minute and um, and see if you can figure out the rest of that puzzle. Fill it in. So I'm going to share my screen again here. Because um, then what I can start to do is once I have those directions written out, you know, how to solve for, you know, um, a missing square maybe in, in row one, column one, quadrant one, and then how to solve for a missing square in um, row two, column two, quadrant two. I can start to look for patterns. So um, kids can start to look for patterns in their directions. You know, look at what's missing in uh, row one. That was from my first set of directions. Look at the bricks missing in row two. That's from my second set of directions. So once they begin to find these patterns, they can simplify those directions, right, which is abstraction. So you can write that sentence so that, um, you know, a lot of it's the same and the only thing that you're changing out might be the row or the column or uh, the quadrant number. 
So if I were doing this with kids, I would have them write out those directions. I'd have them kind of go through these steps um, and, and have a simplified set of directions that they could use. And then I would challenge them to recreate uh, the puzzle, like create a new puzzle um, using that same size grid. So still using four bricks, four different colors, but rearranging them and then test to see well, these set of directions that I've figured out work for any puzzle that's part of this classification of puzzles. And you might think, wow, that's, you know, that's pretty interesting to think about. And it's actually something computer scientists do. So my oldest daughter um, just graduated in May with her master's in computer science. And she did something very similar to this for her master's project. So she had taken a very old um, puzzle that was, uh, part of a classification of puzzles, right? Our family of puzzles that were similar. And she was working to design an algorithm that would solve that puzzle. And she was telling me that, you know, as part of her thesis, that if she could write the algorithm to solve that puzzle, it would solve any puzzle within that classification of puzzles, within that group of puzzles. And it made me think about, you know, how often do we ask kids to, when they um, have written something out like this, you know, test it out to see if it works for other things or if it just works for that, um, for that one specific thing. Uh, so that's kind of where I took the next step. This um, idea, by the way, this little activity came from a great book. It's a modifi it's modified uh, activity that uh, I found in a book called Computational Thinking and Coding for Every Student, um, where they were using a larger Sudoku puzzle to kind of walk through the same things. I, I like having that hands-on um, feature to it to be able to manipulate those things and move it around a little bit, especially for kids who are just getting started with this type of thinking. So the next activity we're gonna do, I'm gonna move this out of the way. Just dump them. There, is um, we're going to do a quick activity around just the idea of sequence. So let's stop sharing again so you can see the big screen. Get some of my, use some Duplos here. So we'll start early on with, with kids and with this idea of sequence. Hey, Leanna, before you begin this one, can you um, give the name of that book again so I can type it in for sure. uh, somebody's asking? It's Computational Thinking and Coding for Every Student. And it's by Jane Krause and Kiki Protzman. James Krause, K-R-A-U-S-S. -S. Okay. I will, I will look for a link and send it and put it in the chat. Oh, thanks. So um, this little activity, the activity I'm getting ready to share it with you is actually one from uh, our Lego Foundation's uh, publication called Six Bricks, but it's a great way to get kids to start thinking about sequence. So if I were gonna do this uh, activity with little kids, I would put three bricks together and I would introduce to them um, the idea of order, right? Brick one, brick two, brick three. And then I would ask kids to create the same sequence of bricks stacked together so that they build something that looks just like mine. But again, really emphasizing, you know, one-to-one -one correspondence, the idea of first, second, third. So they begin to think that way a little bit. And then as they get, um, you know, used to doing three, you can add, maybe add, uh, you know, a fourth brick here. Um, and then have them build as well. If you're doing this virtually, um, you know, kids don't have access to bricks at home, but you have bricks that you're modeling with, kids could use crayons and actually just, you know, draw out the order of the colors that they see um, as well. So the next thing that you do though, is you do this little memory game with them. So you're gonna stack, I usually start with three bricks for little people, probably even for some older, people to get started, but you're going to stack bricks together and you're going to show the bricks to them for a very short amount of time and then you're going to hide the brick and you're going to ask them to recall the sequence of the brick colors, okay? So here's the bricks, first, second, third, and take a good look. Yellow, blue, green. 
All right. Now see if you can remember, you can add in the chat, if you remember what the brick sequence was. You're getting yellow, blue, green, yellow, blue. Yeah. Green. Uh, we've got people with great memories in the session today. Awesome. Correct. Yellow, blue, green. Absolutely. Okay, well, let's try this one. Now I'm, I'm giving you a challenging um, scenario because you all answered so quickly. So this brick sequence, instead of having three, I have six. But I want you to pay close attention um, to see if you can notice something special about this brick sequence that might make it easier to remember. I should tell you this color, by the way, is orange if, if you're having a hard time seeing. All right, let's see how you do with this one. Anybody remember in the chat? Looks like you're getting some answers already. I'll yeah. Look a couple more before. I, uh, but yep, O R, O R Y B, yellow, orange, yellow, orange, yeah. yellow. Lots of people blue. know this one. So why? Um, what did you notice special about this? What did it have within its sequence? Yeah, we have pattern in here, right? So it's a great way to introduce patterns to kids. Um, and if you know, if you wanted to go to like the next step, you could probably introduce the idea of a loop, right? Or repeat because it repeats or it loops um, twice before I go to the next step. Where else in other content areas do we talk about sequencing and patterning patterns? You can add the yeah, math. You're saying math and music? Oh yes, music. That's a new one. Um, yep. Science. Job, oh, skills. job skills. Yeah. That's a good that's one. Good. Yeah. Poetry. Story sequencing and reading. Reading. Yeah, reading and writing. I spent a lot of time um, talking about sequence, beginning, middle, and end. Um, with uh, when I taught kindergarten as well as when I taught fifth grade, especially with writing. So here's some ideas that you can do like the memory game with younger students and older students. Um, so of course with younger students, just like I modeled for you, I would start with, start with a few bricks, probably use Duplos, especially if we're doing something hands-on. But with older students, you can actually um, introduce even more complex patterns because I think it, it's helpful for them to start to recognize a pattern, especially a complex pattern. Because then when they go um, to a, you know, when they're working in a computer program and they want to simplify that program, those patterns start to emerge because it's almost like they've gotten used to looking for those. It's a great skill set to have. So the next little activity I'm gonna do is called back to back. Um, again, uh, I'm using, uh, maybe I'll use our little system bricks, our smaller bricks for this. And I'm gonna lay out here the bricks that I'm going to use for this little activity. So I'm gonna use a green two by four, a blue two by four, a yellow two by two, and um, we'll do a red two by four there. So I'm only gonna use four blocks, mainly for the sake of time. Um, and if you don't have bricks, you can draw out um, what you think this should look like at the end. So the way that you do back to back is I'm going to build something and you're not going to be able to see it. So this will just have nothing on it until I'm completely finished. But as I'm building, I'm going to give directions to you on how to create the same thing. So if you have bricks, you can build. And if you don't have bricks, you can draw it out. I'm going to move my little pieces off and we're going to start. So I'm going to start with the blue two by four brick. And then, um, let me stop sharing here. 
then I'm going to add directly on top of it the red two by four brick. So the red brick covers the blue brick completely. They are parallel, one right on top of the other. And all four sides are very smooth. I'm then going to place the green two by four on top of the red again. So they're stacked um, parallel to one another. No bricks hanging over. All of my sides are even. And then I'm going to take my two by two yellow brick and I'm going to place it to the left of the green brick. And it's going to cover exactly one half of the green brick. So when I look down on what I've built, I will see four yellow studs and four green studs. So the goal is if you've built exactly what I've built uh, based on my directions, that we should have two models that look the same. That yours looks like mine. I don't know if you can see this, but it should look like mine. So this activity, um, great to do with kids, um, but it works on a couple of different computational thinking or computer science skills. First of all, I had to decompose the problem, right? I had to think about um, how I'm going to communicate um, directions to my partner um, for how to build the exact same thing. So then it also works on algorithmic thinking because I'm providing you those step-by-step -step directions you need. I'll come back here to share. You've got some comments. Um, okay. They love this idea and that theirs look just like yours. Um, do you have the portobello sandwich? No, we don't have the portobello sandwich. Oh, somebody's um, um, not on mute. Um, <laughs> yeah, the um, yeah the book, I think, yeah, I think she's gone now, but. Yeah, that's okay. Um, the book is more. called a six, The Six Bricks Book from the Lego Foundation, and we'll make sure that, um, that we share the link out um, to everybody. It's a free resource from uh, the Lego Foundation. So some um, modified versions of back-to-back. -back. Um, so when you do this with kids in face-to-face -face setting, they sit back-to-back, -back, which is why it's called back-to-back. -back. But some kids actually need to see somebody's face when they're given directions. So you can actually do it face-to-face -face, um, and just have kids uh, hide their, their brick creation with a folder or a book. Um, the cool thing about this is, too, the only thing that, um, if you're using bricks, the only thing that really matters is that uh, partner A and partner B have the same set of bricks. So you can easily differentiate this activity for kids um, based on whatever other language it is that you want them to use. You know, if you want them to be very focused on using um, color words, you could give them bricks all the same size so that the only thing that, you know, that you're really kind of forcing them to use that, that language that you want them to use. Um, which would be fun even in uh, upper grades with foreign language classrooms um, when you're learning how to count or colors or shapes or things like that in foreign language classrooms. Um, but face to face, like I said, you can do that uh, with just a file folder hiding it. Mystery build. So again, thinking um, in, in a face to face setting or in a hybrid situation or completely virtual, you can have kids build out something, write the directions step by step give the directions to a peer to see if they can create the same thing. Um, and if you're doing it virtually, it'd be fun for kids to take a picture of what they've built, for their peer to take a picture of what they've built and uh, compare it uh, with each other. And then, you know, partner A, if they were the ones that initially gave the directions, they could go back and um, refine those directions based on, you know, how partner B built it and then give it to another student. Because really, you know, if I'm the one giving directions, my partner is kind of acting like the computer, right? They're the ones that, that are executing my steps that I've given. So if I've left something out, um, my partner is not going to know to do it. Just like if I'm writing a program and I've left something out, the computer isn't going to know uh, to do that. 
You can also do multi-person back-to-back, like I modeled for you all. It could be you, the teacher, sharing, but you could also have kids do it too, um, which is fun. And then here's some ideas of ways that you can do this with younger students and older students. And with older students, you can introduce that idea of what pseudocode is, you know, um, kind of giving a, a steps to a, a computer program um, in actual words and language, right? What you want the computer to do when you hit um, go or start or, you know, enter, whatever, um, when you launch it with the event. But you can also have kids write the directions in a different way um, for the same outcome to start to think about, you know, well, which set of directions might be the best to use? You know, is there one that's more efficient than another? Um, do I always end up with the same result at the end? I should. Um, because with computer programs, a lot of times there's more than one way, obviously, to, to write a program. So it gets kids thinking about that a little bit as well. So Brick Sequence, oops, sorry, knocking my computer keyboard around here. Brick Sequence, also fun to do um, with kids. Um, make this big so you all can see again, maybe. So, Leanna, have, you had a comment. You had oh, a comment yes. In the previous, um, they're saying that using it for EL students or suggesting it for the elementary Spanish teacher, which I thought was fantastic. Oh, awesome. Yes. Yeah. Great ideas. So, uh, brick sequence, we um, are thinking about assigning movements to some bricks. So, I have a green brick here that would be like wave your left hand. I have red that is stomp your feet. Can see that very well with the glare. Might be kind of backwards, not quite sure. Um, clapping. And so you can assign some movements to bricks for kids. And then once they kind of get an understanding, you know, I'm going to wave, I'm going to stomp my feet, I'm going to clap, um, you can create some fun little scenarios for them to see if they can follow with some bricks and doing the movement. You can also introduce this idea of looping to them, right? So let's say I have my sequence here, but let's say I want to repeat all of my steps to my little dance I've created. Um, maybe I want to repeat it three times. So I'm just going to stick this little yellow brick down here and I'm just going to say anything that's yellow, I'm going to designate as a loop and we're just going to loop it the number of studs that are on that brick. So because this is three, we would loop this whole thing three times. You could also talk about repeating other actions in here. Maybe I wanted to wave my hand twice before I went to the next step. I can put a little yellow brick there so I know that I need to do this action twice before I move to the next and then repeat three times. So fun way to create some um, dances with code and brick, uh, using brick color. And uh, it's also fun to have kids, once they have figured this out, create their own dance moves. Um, you know, work with a partner, then um, put some bricks in order to see if they can, uh, can complete the dance that they have constructed. Also, it'd be fun to do virtually, um, especially if you're on a Zoom call with your kids, because you could lead that activity and have them follow. And then in the slide deck, you will see, again, just some ideas of how you can do this with younger students and older students. You know, with younger students, really kind of hitting home this idea of when I see this, I'm going to do this. Um, and with older students, I put multiple loops, it's actually called nested loops, but you know, using those nested loops um, within a larger loop uh, to understand um, kind of what looping is and what that means. So I'm just gonna walk through these slides real quick. Inside or outside is a way that you can introduce um, conditional thinking, conditional um, statements like if else, um, as well as Boolean language, right? So Boolean language, it's, it's either a yes or a no, right? It, it, the condition is true or it's not, um, or it fits the condition or it doesn't, right? So here I have just uh, you know, a circle and a piece of paper, 
Uh, if you're using, um, I'm actually pulling a lot of pieces from our spike prime set that I'm demoing with. So like in some of our, our um, sets, we have frames like this, or you could build a frame or build a box out of bricks to use as your circle if you didn't want to uh, draw it out. Um, but you're going to give kids a condition and then you're going to tell them, you know, what the inside of that circle represents versus the outside. So the condition for this um, image is yellow. So if it's yellow, if it's true, it's going to go inside the circle. If it's not true, which we're saying else, it's going to go outside the circle. So you'll notice it doesn't matter how many studs the brick has. The only thing that really matters is if it's a yellow piece. So it could be a brick. Um, if you're doing this with Lego pieces, it could even be something like this, um, which is a, an axle rod that's yellow. Then you can flip it. So, you know, thinking about if that condition is not true, that's what we're going to put in the middle. So in that case, anything that's not yellow is going in the middle and everything that is yellow is going on the outside. So the next one um, introduces that language of and. So both condition A and condition B have to be true to be inside that, that um, center circle. So the conditions are yellow, but now we've added the second condition that it needs to have eight studs. So you'll notice this brick up here, even though he's yellow, he's sitting outside the circle. And even though this brick has eight studs, he's also sitting outside the circle because he's not big enough, even though he's yellow, and though he's the right size, he's not the right color. And then the last um, word that we talk about a lot with Boolean uh, language is or. So, you know, or is a little different. Like when we're talking in the English language and, you know, you're asking, you know, um, your, your child maybe, you know, do you want a uh, strawberry ice cream or do you want chocolate chip? Um, it's one or the other. But in the world of computer science, it means something a little different, right? Because it's, it's kind of but like this condition or this condition, if they're both true, they're going to fit in here, right? So if it's yellow, um, actually it should have been yellow or eight right here. So even though this one isn't yellow, it has eight studs, so it's going inside that circle as well. So a uh, great activity to do, even with little kids, you can ask them to start looking for common characteristics among uh, a set of bricks. Uh, Duplo bricks, you know, do they have the same shape, same color, same function? Um, and with older kids, you can start to move to some, you know, more complex ideas um, and maybe even uh, complex conditional statements. It's a great activity for just logic as well. Um, great for kids. So stacking bricks. Um, we'll come back to here. Stacking bricks is kind of a fun activity um, that you can use to start thinking about what a variable is. So with this one, um, you know, you're just giving kids four bricks to start with. You have them stack the bricks. And all the bricks are the same size. Um, but then you have them write out some pseudocode for how to stack those bricks, right? And then once they have that code written, then you ask them to stack the bricks again. Um, but in a different way. And you might have them do this uh, two or three times, but the idea is they should start to look for patterns in that studio code and realize the only thing that's probably really changing between what's first, second, third, and fourth is the color of the brick. You could also do this with Uh, numbers, right, or size of the brick. So, you know, I could stack it this way, one on top of the other, you know, change it up so that, um, so that it's size in regards to first, second, third, fourth, that's really changing. Um, 
So you can start to introduce that idea about what a variable is um, to kids. And also, again, get them to look for those patterns in pseudocode that they are creating. So like, um, like the other activities, I have written out things that you can do with younger kids, things that you could do with older kids. I thought this would be a fun thing even to do with minifigs. If you have lots of um, you know, minifig parts, um, thinking about you know, legs, uh, torsos, heads, hair, tools, um, uh, building those out. You can even begin to introduce you know, uh, conditional statements along with uh, those variables as well. So guess my brick, um, real quick here. Um, I like this activity because everything I've shown you so far really hits on algorithms and programming. This one is geared toward networks and security. So for this activity, we're going to start with three bricks, green, blue, red here. And I'm going to create a password that is one brick long and one color. So it's going to be one of these three. So take a good look, and I'm going to select one of these to be my password. And in the chat, I want to see if you can guess what my password is. All right, let's see if you can guess my password. You're getting a few answers. So they're saying blue, red, blue, green, green eight, blue, That's good. red, green, Lots of good ideas. Those who guessed blue, you would have taken my treasure, right? <laughs> um, but if I had three colors and my password was one brick long, um, how many times would it take you to guess before you guessed correctly? Yeah, three, pretty simple. Um, you know, and these were conversations I used to have with my students, you know, why your first name is probably not good to have for a password or your initials, right, um, for my little people, um, because it's really easy for someone to guess. And we don't want a password that's easy for somebody to, to figure out. So this kind of helps them begin to think about, you know, wow, that was easy to get, you know, to guess. What happens if I added a fourth color? Would that make it a little more difficult to guess? maybe. But what if I had a two color password and you had to guess my, the first color of my password and the second color of my password. So we're going to test that out. So you know it's going to be, you know, green, blue, red, yellow. Those are the colors I'm using. But this time it's two, two colors long and you have to guess them in the correct order. Let's see if you can guess. You're, you're getting a couple answers. I don't know if you see that. I will tell you, nobody's guessed correctly. Oh, maybe somebody has. Uh, Melissa, at first I thought you got it, but then Jean has it. You have, Melissa almost had it in the correct order. So it was blue. And then yellow um, was my password combination. So when you think about making it even more complex, you know, what would happen if, you know, I repeated colors, if I could do that, right? So I could use blue and blue. What happens if I start adding bricks of a different size? And now you have to guess color and size, or maybe this one in here so you can see it. Um, function, right? It's a connector piece there. Something like this. Um, that's yellow, but you know, um, it's not a brick, right? So you can talk about how you can make it a little more complex, like your password using bricks, right? And and you can leave that conversation, especially for our older kids, around why we have passwords. A lot of times people will require you to have a password that has a capital letter, a lowercase letter, a number, a symbol, or whatever, because it is really hard to guess. And even for older kids, it would be fun to have them calculate out the number of um, possible solutions um, around some constraints with that. 
So um, now we're getting close to the end of time. I'm going to wrap up here real quick. Um, so you'll have that um, uh, some ideas for younger students and older students uh, in the slide deck as well around the guess my password. And then here's just some additional unplugged ideas that you can do around um, pixels, binary code. But also I just want you to think about, you know, just ways that you can use bricks for kids to just build out their ideas um, around computer science and to share that idea um, with their model. And hopefully you saw that a lot of these activities have a low floor, meaning it's pretty easy to get started or easy to understand, but really you can make it super complex or more challenging as kids need the challenge. And there's lots of ways to integrate it within other content areas. And just so you know, Lego Education, we have a pretty nice coding progression um, with our products, but you'll see too those unplugged activities going pre-K to 12 because they really are important to um, include in every grade level um, for kids. So I didn't know if we had any questions from anyone. Paul, oh, the chat here. I don't see any questions, but I did put a link to a Lego created brick set that's relatively inexpensive um, and happy to send you a, a, a code to try to get a little discount. The, uh, the form that I'm using link is also, I'm gonna put that back up one more time so that you can make sure you give me your contact information because I'll also send you other resources that we have that are free, like we have homeschooling resources and we, um, we also have a teacher, um, I think, yep, a teacher community. So we're encouraging everyone to join our Lego community, which is what Leanna has on the screen right now. And I believe that the chat area is going to be shared with you, everyone, so that you can have those links for um, And um, we'll make sure you get some additional links for, there's some at-home resources too for Steam with, if you're using uh, bricks, ways you can do that at home. And then um, Lego Education always loves to see what people are doing uh, out in the classroom. So I'm gonna make sure I shared all of our social media um, tags there for you or handles so you can follow us and tag us um, so we can see all the great things that you all are doing uh, in Illinois. Fantastic. That was awesome, you guys. Thank you so much, Leanna. Those were um, great ways to integrate coding um, into unplugged activities for, sh for sure. Um, I, when I was a classroom teacher, I used to do um, other kinds of activities and this would have been a fun hands-on way. So I wish I would have known this back then. Awesome. Thank you so much for sharing. Um, I am gonna go ahead and actually share my screen if that's okay. Yep. Um, so that I can tell you guys about our upcoming two webinars. Um, so next week we have a webinar with EduPlanet 21 on virtual curriculum design with Jay McTeague. Um, he did the Understanding by Design book, um, so Timely Units for COVID-19. Um, I know that the focus um, says it's going to be on so science and social studies, um, but certainly applicable to anything, so those just happen to be the lessons that he's going to um, present in this um, webinar next week. So definitely go to our website and check that out. I'm going to put the link in the, um, in the chat window in just a second. And then the following week, we have another one with EduPlanet, um, Reimagining Professional Learning with Habits of Mind. Um, so again, I'm going to go ahead and put the links for both of those in the chat window. So let me actually do that right now. I'm going to stop sharing so that you guys don't see all of my other craziness on my screen. Um, I'm also going to put the um, link for the PDHs in the chat window. So you're getting a bunch of stuff coming through the chat window right now. So the first one is the link for the PDH. Just go ahead and click that link and um, you'll fill out the Google form. If you're looking for PDHs for Illinois and or just um, a completion certificate, please go ahead and do that. Um, the next one is our Wednesday webinars. We do have webinars just about every single Wednesday and over um, remote learning. We had them Tuesday through Thursday. So um, there's all kinds of resources, all kinds of previous webinars on that Wednesday webinar page of our website. This um, session was also recorded and I will not only send you out the links tomorrow to the session, the um,
slide deck and the chat file, but the um, session recording will also be on our website. So if you need to share it with any um, colleagues, please do so as well. And then that final link there is the registration calendar for all of our events. Um, we have fantastic events coming up, including our um, Idea U, which is our new summer institute that's going to be um, in just under a month from now, just about three weeks from now. And um, that is going to be uh, a virtual conference. Um, so definitely check that out. All of those things are on our um, ideaillinois.org calendar page. So Leanna, um, Alexandra, thank you so much for today. I know we're at the top of the hour. It doesn't look like um, the only question in there is the link for the six brick book. Um, so I think that um, Alexandra is going to shoot that out to you guys. Alexandra, if you want to put that in the chat window, they can get it that way. Also, if you want to email me that, I can include that in the um, email that goes out to everybody tomorrow with the recordings, et cetera, et cetera. Um, That's good. It's, so, it's in the PowerPoint also. Like she posted. Oh, perfect. It's in the PowerPoint. So there's okay, a link so there. You'll get the PowerPoint tomorrow, Susan, and um, you'll have the link for that book as well. So awesome. Thank you, Alexandra. Yeah. Um, so without that, I think that's all the questions. Alexandra, Leanna, thank you so much. Thank you to everybody who joined us today. And um, hopefully we'll see you guys next week. And definitely, hopefully we will see you at Idea U. So check all those things out on our um, website. Thanks, everybody. Thanks thank so you. much. Bye. Bye, guys.